Yeah. Let's go to the States. Yeah. I, I think they might only have like four or five people, but uh, uh, we're in next year, we'll make sure. Yeah. Police chief just resigned, and then all the officers quit. So the county <coughs> north of Texas, because of the new mayor, they didn't like the new mayor. So here's my real question. So they just all quit. It was like, wow. I'm good. We apparently are making the statements that they don't care. They'll stand some of them. No, no, no. They all have to do something. Well, they're kind of in the same boat. They don't want to pay their that, that was part of the article. It said that they're too, too They don't pay the police officers enough to get them. I said it's down the street. Yeah, but I mean, that's a small town. It's just. Right. Yeah. I know, see, don't assume because of that kid right there, it's kind of like, you know, the jinxes. Oh, that's why I connected to the Welcome, everybody. Good evening, and we will start with roll call, Suzanne. Mayor Levy. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Harvey. Here. Carlson. Here. Matthews. Here. Mella. Here. Sawyer. Here. Schaefer. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. If you all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> okay, thank you. We will move on to item number four and Suzanne. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> this evening we have an interested applicant for the Keep Woodland Park Beautiful Committee. We have um, Miss Kay Jacobson, who is in the audience. She's right there waving to everybody. And she's interested in um, being on the committee and has applied to applications and everything are on the dais for you. And she is here this evening, available to answer any questions, and I am prepared to swear her in upon approval. Terrific. Council, do we have any questions of Ms. Jacobson? Would you like to say anything? If you would, you can come forward to the to the podium if you would. Thank you. <laughs> We're not going to even give you a choice on this one. If you just give us your name and address, please, to start. Uh, Kay Jacobson, 580 Black Bear Trail, Woodland Park, 80863. And I just moved up here in May, so I'm well, delighted welcome. to be up here. And I really don't have anything really critical or important to say uh, other than, you know, I've done this before. I, I lived in Colorado Springs, and I worked with the North Cheyenne Canyon cleanup, but I did a lot of cleanup by myself. I lived on Gold Camp Road, and that place was always, <laughs> always full of beer bottles and and liquor bottles and things. So I was, I'm, I'm experienced, okay? <laughs> the experience picking up trash. <laughs> well, we, we really appreciate you being here. Um, Thank you. You've been here since May. Yes. And obviously you love Woodland Park. You can say that again if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do. I used to work, I had a job in Glenwood Springs. I lived in Colorado Springs, I lived in Glenwood Springs, and I'd commute back and forth for two years every weekend. And uh, every time I drove through Woodland Park, I said, when, when I retire, this is where I want to live. And so it happened. That's great. Well, thanks for being here. Council, any further discussion? No, just thank you for taking an interest in, in the community. I'm glad yes. to be involved. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. All right. Um, I just need a motion to approve Kay Jacobson for the uh, Keep Woodland Park Beautiful Committee. I would move that we would uh, approve Kay Jacobson for Keep Woodland Park Beautiful Committee. Second. Thank you. Suzanne? 
Carlson? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Levy? Yes. Matthews? Yes. Mella? Yes. Sawyer? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. I'll swear you in. Make this official. So if you raise your right hand and state your name. Kay Jacobson. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And of the State of Colorado. And the State of Colorado. The Charter and Ordinances. The Charter and Ordinances. Of the City of Woodland Park. The City of Woodland Park. And that I will faithfully perform. And I will faithfully perform. The duties. The duties. Of Keep Woodland Park Beautiful Committee. Of Keep Woodland Park Beautiful <laughs> upon which I'm about to enter. About, uh, about what I'm about to enter. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Let's have you sign this and we'll make it official. Okay. I suppose I should read it. It's <laughs> exactly what I just read. Okay, <laughs> okay good. Just one more. Oh, okay, good. And then I don't know if you know Sally. Have you met Sally? Okay. So here's, this is for your records. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very, very much. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item agenda, agenda item number five, if there are no additions, solutions, or corrections. In the consent calendar, we only have one item tonight to approve the minutes of November 19th. Suzanne? Thank you. Harvey? Yes. Levy? Yes. Matthews? Yes. Mella? Yes. Sawyer? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Suzanne. I uh, didn't finish business tonight. Uh, we're on Number eight ordinances on initial posting and welcome Aaron Smith. Mayor, just a, maybe a procedural, I'm sorry. Uh, Suzanne and I were having a sidebar conversation to, to answer a question. And I don't know that a motion was made to adopt the minutes. I think you asked Suzanne and she called the roll. Thank you. So can we just Thank make you. a motion and redo that just Why to stand do that? So uh, move to uh, accept the consent calendar. Second. Now, would you call the roll again? No, we're on the record. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Levy. Yes. Matthews. Yes. Nella. Yes. Sawyer. Yes. Schaefer. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Harvey. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, David. Yes, sir. Okay, Aaron. We're on item number eight. Mayor and Council, item number eight is an ordinance to uh, approve entering into a contract with the um, school district, Woodland Park RE2, for the purchase of a parcel of property that's described in that ordinance uh, for the purpose of building the aquatic center. The ordinance then um, refers to a form of contract. That contract has been provided to Council. That contract can, is composed of four parts, and I'd like to go over those with Council and uh, let you know that the cover of, of that contract is an actual contract to buy and sell real estate, which is the standard Colorado form. It is altered by an addendum. That addendum incorporates a number of fairly standard provisions put into um, the Colorado form contract when the buyer happens to be a public entity. The key, a couple key provisions in that addendum are paragraph D, which expresses uh, an explicit contingency to this transaction and that contingency is that seller delivers a uh, form of intergovernmental agreement and substantially in the form of what's attached to this exhibit B 
to the closing. The other key provision of the addendum is paragraph P. And paragraph P also requires that closing that buyer shall grant to seller a right of first offer in the form attached as Exhibit C. And then those uh, refer reference documents are attached as Exhibit B and C. This is before you on first reading. Um, however, if there are any questions I can answer with regard to form, I'd be happy to do that now. Thank you, Council. Anybody have a question? I'll let Noel and John. It says Exhibit A, there's. Exhibit A is a um, legal description for the parcel, which will um, be firmed up by a survey. Um, yeah, so all the documents that you've referred to, uh, like the uh, intergovernmental agreement, uh, <coughs> open to the public at such time as you've approved it or something? Well, they're available to the public now, in yeah, fact. Okay. They, were part of the, they were part of the packet for okay. the... Back they're on the back table if anybody would like a copy. Any other questions? Just a, a comment um, and a, a statement. I'm going to be voting against this at this time and uh, going forward, not because of any, shouldn't be misconstrued as a comment uh, with respect to the location of the school, the aquatic center. Rather, it's a comment on the process that was arrived at uh, the decision. So I believe strongly that the process was not in keeping with full transparency with respect to public input and a public debate by council. And I feel strongly that was not in keeping with the best practices of political governance. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Anybody else? Comments? If not, we'll entertain a motion to consider Ordinance 1263 on initial posting. I move to consider Ordinance 1263 on initial posting and schedule it for our next meeting on 17 December. Second. Second. A second. Thank you. Any further discussion? If not, Suzanne? Matthews? Yes. Mella? No. Sawyer? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Levy? Yes. Motion carries 6 1. Thank you. Okay, move on to agenda number 9. Public hearings, and we're going to approve ordinance number 1261, or we're going to speak about approving ordinance 1261. Wally, welcome. Thank you, Mayor Levy, and uh, good evening, Council. Uh, ordinance 1261 is an ordinance appropriating sums of money to the various funds that the city operates uh, as uh, set forth in the budget uh, that the Council has already reviewed. Uh, Council has heard the budget message. There have been discussions on the various fund components uh, of that budget. So at this time, I, I would recommend that uh, Council approve Ordinance 1261, uh, subject to any questions that perhaps I can answer for you. Who would like to start? No questions for Mr. Dunio. If not, I'll call for motion to approve Ordinance Number 1261. So moved. Second. Second. Bob, I'm sorry. Sorry, I, I did have one question on refunding the 99 COPs. That that money to pay off the old COPs came from the issuance of the new COPs? That is correct. <clears throat> okay. And only only the money from the new COPs. Was there any other mon money like general fund or 410 or anything like that? No, the, the amount that was determined for the... Uh, for the 2015 COPs um, had two, two components. The first being an amount sufficient to retire the 99 COP balance and the amount sufficient to fund the Memorial Park development. 
Okay. So the, the new COPs we have paid off the old, but also paid for uh, a portion portion of Memorial Park then? That's correct, sir. Okay, great. Thank yes. You. Thanks, Bob. Any other questions? Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Suzanne? Miller? Yes. Sawyer? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Levy? Excuse me. It's a public hearing. I've got to see if anybody else would like to comment. My apologies, audience. If anyone here would like to comment on this, this is your time. Feel free to come up and... Okay, if not, then we'll start the vote again, please. Thank you. Sawyer? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Levy? Yes. Matthews? Yes. Mella? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll move on to 9B. Uh, Council, uh, 9B references Ordinance 1262. Uh, every year, uh, we appear before Council and make a request that the current year's budget that we're currently operating in be adjusted for <coughs> various factors. Uh, that for whatever reasons caused certain line items to go over the budgeted amount. So, <clears throat> I beg your pardon. So this is the purpose of Ordinance 1262. Attached to that is a schedule that lists out the, uh, the various accounts and amounts where we are asking for uh, Council's approval to do a supplemental appropriation relative to the 2015 budget. Uh, if there are any additional questions, I would be happy to answer them uh, for you and for the public. <clears throat> Wally, can you clarify this again? These are amounts over what we've already talked about? Yes. Or, uh, yes, the, these are amounts over and above what was approved uh, about this time last year, in, tw in 2014, for the 2015 budget. So legal services were asking for 80000 more or 80000 total? No, 80000 more than was budgeted for. What was that original budgeted amount? I believe it was 40 40000 but a council uh, should remember that at the time the 2015 budget was done, uh, there were a lot of a lot of balls in play uh, relative to the bond and the CLP issues. Uh, we didn't have a firm idea of what those additional costs would be. Um, so hence the other, the other two, a uh, couple of the other line items there, refunding the 99 COPs. We had done the 2015 budget uh, on the assumption that those events would not occur. But they did approve, or they, they did occur rather the bond issue was successful, the COP issuance was successful, and these are, uh, a lot of these items are costs that were associated with those. The original budget was 90000 and 90, what, what Wally says is correct about the bonds and the COPs, but we've had quite a litigious year. Uh, if you think about the cases that we're currently working on, all of those require legal work. Um, Carly, Waller, uh, and there are several more that we've had to spend more money than we anticipated. So this is definitely more money in that line item. There have been savings in others. What this doesn't show you is the savings that we've realized. What we don't do is we don't ever exceed the general fund amount plus the ability to back that up with the reserves. So but as an example, the refunding of the COPs, that's an expense that you didn't approve uh, when the budget was passed because we hadn't gone through the COP process. So there's also a revenue stream on the other side of that that the COPs were, were being paid for, as Mr. Carlson alluded to. Same thing with Memorial Park. We received the COP money, and that allowed us to make these additional expenditures that are shown here. Same thing with the Aquatic Center expense. Same thing with fleet maintenance. 
we didn't know for sure when you did the 2015 budget that we were going to be proceeding on with the fleet maintenance facility. So for the vast majority of these, there's a revenue component of this as well as an expense component. Street lighting, I think it's because we had more street lamps knocked down than we anticipated. So it's, it's simple things like that that cause some of these lines to bump up. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit on the aquatic center expense of 319698 Sure. That was some of the expenses that we incurred with some of the design elements in the, in the Woodland Station location. Recall that we did have to do some design work with our architects and with the engineers to arrive at that point where I had been to recommend to you that we didn't need to spend any more money in that area, but those were some of the sunk costs that we had for that process. So that 319 was design? Yes. No acquisition of land, but it was of the architects and the engineers. Okay. Dave, that's... Uh, 14,000 for computer repairs and then 54,000 for internet? We it's had to change, it, and it's all IT things, <coughs> not just the internet, but we changed our uh, email service, uh, and that took quite a bit of time. We had to upgrade, upgrade numerous components within our IT systems. I, I don't have the specific breakdown of each of those items. I would suggest in future years you provide some more details. Okay. And even the revenue stream on the other side. Okay. Yeah, we'd echo that. Yeah, remember that a budget, and, and we'll do that, I'm not being argumentative, but remember that budgets authorize expenditures, they don't authorize revenues. But we'll gladly show you, and, and actually what, in, in the budget document that you have for 2016, it has all of those 2015 right. revenues. But we'll, we'll absolutely provide that to make it crystal clear what the coverage is for those expenses. Yeah, but that's a very good point, David, and I, I concur with that. To me, the issue is just full transparency sure. for the public. Yes, sir. That's our, one of our charges. And we can do that. Thank you. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, my comment on the previous document really applied to this document. <laughs> and I didn't That's what I comment thought. on the previous one. Yes, I get that no matter what, or like we're snafuing tonight on a number of things. Uh, am I still able to make a motion on the previous document? On which previous document? The uh, 2016 budget? No, yeah, the 1262 one. That's done. It's done. done. It's done. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else on 1262? If not, we'll call for a minute. Well, we'll have a public comment. <coughs> no public comment. Any further discussion? Anything else, Bob? No. Call for a motion to approve ordinance number 1262. Motion to approve ordinance 1262. Second. Second. Thank you. Suzanne? Schaefer? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Levy? Yes. Matthews? Yes. Mella? Yes. Sawyer? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Council. Thank you very much. Okay. New business and Sally Riley. Thank you. I'll take just a second to get the projectors on here. A brief PowerPoint for this item. This item is to consider an application to the State Historic Preservation Office for a certified to be considered as a certified local government and authorize the mayor to sign the local government certification agreement. So with a little bit of background. Oops. Oh, okay. Um, the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 had a number of uh, legislative items that allowed for the country to establish a national register of historic places. Each state was to set up a historic preservation office. Those are called SHPOs. 
and that certified local governments could be part of this program that could receive tax credits and also review projects that receive federal funds under the Section 106 reviews. The purpose of this act was to emphasize that historic preservation was important and put the enabling legislation in place to protect and encourage preservation throughout the country. And this was a time when there was a lot of <coughs> urban renewal going on, so we were losing many of the old buildings in our core cities. So this was one of those ways in which the country began to address the loss of uh, older buildings and preserve um, historic preservation. So locally, what this city did was Ordinance 607 in 1994 as our enabling legislation, and that was for the purpose for protecting and preserving the city's historical and cultural heritage, and authorized the city to um, establish or designate local historic landmarks, and they could then qualify for state historic fund grants. And it also established a five-member citizen committee and encouraged participation and understanding of the city's unique heritage. So Ordinance 607, back 21 years ago, uh, established the city's preservation program. And over the years, the committee has taken what we call baby steps. Um, so we have now grown to the point where we believe that we would qualify and be eligible for a certified local government status because our five-member committee, which includes Gary Crane, Larry Black, Lori Gloth, Dave Langley, and Michelle Perkins, are a dedicated group and they also qualify or are eligible for this certified local government. 40% of your committee, so two out of the five, are required to have a professional uh, status. And the two that have professional status on our committee is our local architect, Dave Langley, and our local historian, Larry Black. And with a CLG status, they, we are obligated to enforce our local ordinance, 604, meet at least four times a year, participate in training, and provide for a system of inventory and surveys of historic structures within our town and to welcome public participation. So all their meetings are open to the public. The advantages to become a CLG are basically twofold. Uh, first of all, we will qualify for non-match grants. Currently, right now, if we apply for a grant through the State Historic Fund, we compete with the entire state and there's a 20% match. With this status, we compete for a um, specific amount of money that is fenced only for CLGs and there's no match. And there's a little bit more flexibility with that because we can apply for planning grants and other things to help advance our preservation program. Secondly, being a Main Street candidate community the uh, Division of Local Affairs likes for communities to be CLGs if you're a Main Street candidate. And it gives us more clout to be able to move toward that designated community. So we have matured over the last uh, 15 years or so to be able to now apply for the status. And in fact, Larry Black and I met with the coordinator last week Mark Rodman, and we are putting together this application, and this is one of the steps of that application, is that the model of the agreement is signed <coughs> by the mayor. So the purpose this evening is for us to ask you to consider that. 
The only disadvantages to this is that it will take a little bit more staff time, but I have a terrific volunteer group that I'll be delegating some of this to in order to submit an annual report and administer, help administer grants uh, that we can now qualify for. So we would recommend that you move to support the application to the state SHPO office and authorize the mayor to sign the local government certificate agreement. <coughs> Happy to answer questions and Carol has been sitting uh, as your council liaison with the Historical Preservation Committee over the last couple of years and we've been discussing this at length during the meetings. What I don't recall, Sally, is um, once the mayor signs the, um, agreement. the agreement, how soon would we know if we've been designated? We will um, package everything together and submit that. Uh, I believe it's going to take at least a month for them to review the packet and make that determination. And, and the group now that's on the committee, terrific group, but if we lose any one of those two professionals, either one of the two professionals, we would lose the opportunity to apply. So I'd say strike while the iron is hot <laughs> before one of them leaves us for whatever reason. I was going to suggest if someone does leave that we look to appoint someone who is a professional. So you've got three anticipating a future uh, that's that's a very good point and we could probably Gary Crane might be able to qualify currently yeah, yeah. being a local builder um, but they as part of this application they'll all be submitting their resumes and so Mark Rodman will make that determination otherwise I think it's a wonderful program thank you you talked about one of their duties is to enforce the ordinance yes. um, you haven't gone into a lot of detail in the ordinance, but I, I do have a question about whether something is covered, like historic preservation. Is there anything in the ordinance right now that would prevent somebody from buying up that whole row of cabins off uh, the north side of, of uh, Lake Avenue, demolishing them all and putting in high-rise or, you know, 30-foot buildings? No, there is not. Is there anything we can do to correct that? What we have in place right now is a demolition permit. Uh, all that does, though, is allow for the staff and the Preservation Committee to be aware that that's um, pending and inevitable, but it is a property right for people to be able to demolish existing structures. So our approach is more from an encouragement standpoint to um, let people know that we value those structures and if they want to landmark them with a local landmark then we're in support of that so what well, well, there are property rights and then there's zoning uh, that that you know where the community says we want to preserve certain things or uh, and uh, maybe Aaron would be the one to ask here is but is it are there any towns in Colorado that have an ordinance with that would protect their historic structures. Probably in Boulder. But we would probably have to buy those historical structures and own them for the city. If they're on if they're on private land, they well, can demolish them all the time. I mean it's it, it they there are historic preservation ordinances that run the gamut from um, those that have a um, restriction that is um, backed up by um, more than just encouragement, but also sometimes some uh, government money to pay for the, um, the, the, use, the uses of the property that have been eliminated. Um, and then there are those that are much more, like Sally suggests, where they operate um, on a volunteer encourage, encouraging basis. You know, um, there are, even in the cities that have sort of a more aggressive historic preservation ordinance, um, you don't see them um, exercising that power in a great, um, a great amount of the time. 
So um, Denver is actually one city right now looking very closely at its historic preservation laws and dealing with a lot of um, tension between uh, those in neighborhoods who have a preservationist point of view and those in neighborhoods who want to be able to uh, provide their children and, and family with um, some sort of a legacy from the property rights that they have. So they run the gamut and they tend to, even when they are very aggressive, they tend not to be always exercised in that fashion. So it's probably the, the kind of um, topic that council could, you know, um, get a lot of extra information on in the form of some sort of a work session. You'd have um, your staff pull together some of those various ordinances. Because this has come up with regard to uh, the Paradise Lodge, a lot of action, I mean, upset people in the community that we couldn't stop that. Of course, we waited to the last possible moment. They were already demolishing it, basically. But there are some cabins along the lake that are uh, subject to uh, be some people have already bought them, and it looks like they may end up going. So I know our, our Main Street group are, are also joining with Historic Preservation, and we got to do something about this. But uh, uh, I would support you know, looking a little further into this, uh, if, if Sally's got the staff time to do it. Uh, but, but it, you know, we are supposed to, I mean, we have a it's the historic preservation office, and why have it if we're not preserving anything? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, sir, um, it's a balance, obviously, that is struck by the local community. And, uh, I would say that my view is that property rights are preeminent and I would not support any staff time to evaluate this further. Any other thoughts? One of the efforts that the <coughs> Preservation Committee has undertaken is the survey process of um, his, what we would consider historical um, buildings in, in the city limits. but. Um, None of the buildings in the in the city within the city limits merit uh, national preservation uh, designation. Um, but through the survey process, I think we we've, we've helped owners understand a lot of the owners aren't even here in the community. A lot of them are out of state. Help them understand that we do value that property and that, and that we want to acknowledge it as part of the history of the community. Uh, but I, I agree with you, Phil. I'm, I'm, I would, I, I think property rights are the eminent concern. Is this, Sally, is this a competitive application, meaning you're going to, like Main Street was competitive? This no. one's not? No, it's as long as we're eligible and meet that threshold, then we will the become certified. Was the amount of historical buildings, or no. I, I guess I missed it. Was that the, it was the, it's the makeup of the committee itself is, is what has pushed us to eligibility for this designation. This designation, as Sally has already mentioned, does help us move up the food chain in the Main Street <coughs> candidacy. Right. Um, so in that respect, it does help us compete for that designation. But it, this is pretty straightforward. We have the opportunity now because Sally and her staff and the Historic Preservation <coughs> Committee have, have, have gone through the uh, crawl, walk, run steps, and now they're at the point that they can they can actually apply for this. And, and to comment on Phil's, I do agree that uh, private property is private property, and you can do what you want on it. If if we wanted to preserve something so badly, then the city would actually have to purchase, purchase. it. Uh, so that's kind of in the in the Paradise Lodge was asbestos. Lay on the pain, it was it had to go. Right. I understood that. Somebody could have bought it. Yeah. And if they wanted to, it would have been great. <clears throat> Very expensive too. Hugely expensive. Yeah. So I know plus the property. Well one of the, one of the reasons we got so far in the Main Street program to date is because of those cabins along that street. And I would hope that just the persuade you know, persuading the owners to Yep. No, I mean, preserve that. If we do get the application, I did see that said 20% tax credit. Is that correct? One of the benefits. So 
Yeah, so there are benefits to the owner to keep it. There's encouragements. Okay. Good. Okay. I appreciate that cost. Anybody else? Yeah. John? What's the uh, amount of funds that are potentially available through this uh, CLG status? These are state funds administered by the State Historic Preservation Office? They are. They are. I saw that number probably a year ago, and I'm going to give you just a very broad range. Uh, it's in the tens of thousands of dollars. I don't think it's hundreds of thousands of dollars that's shared among 52 communities right now. So I can get back with you, John, with that specific, if you'd like in the future. I know your memory's better than one <laughs> year. <laughs> All right. Yes, I'm just interested. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and typically the grant sizes are like five to ten thousand right. per round. Yeah. I was thinking larger, but yeah. not you <laughs> They're not large. <laughs> All right, thank you. It's mainly to continue uh, surveys a few at a time or do some planning for preservation plans, those sorts of things. But, but this designation allows us to have access to grant money that we don't have to match. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it gives us a better opportunity. If we have the CLG status, we have a leg up, if you will, on the Main Street designations. That's first and foremost, correct? Yes. Assuming we get this in a month or two, give me a sense, refresh our memory. I think we're maybe a year or so from getting that designation. Was it a two-year period or two? Uh, it varies depending upon how uh, DOLA views the community and how many things they accomplish. Uh, I think it took Victor about four years before they became a designated community. Usually it's two to three years. Any other questions of Sally? Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, we don't have any other questions. Um, we will take part of the comment. And if anyone would like to comment on this, if not, we will call for a motion. Uh, move to uh, um, authorize the mayor to sign the local government certification agreement. Second. Thank you. Susanna? Carlson? Yes. Harvey? Yes. Levy? Yes. Matthews? Yes. Mella? Yes. Sawyer? Yes. Schaefer? Yes. Thank you. Seven, nothing carries. Thank you, Suzanne. Sally, thank you again. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on to public comment. And I have two folks on the agenda there. If you want to come together, Mary Jo and Marty, you want to be individual. Tag team? I'm spectating. You're spectating. Okay. Okay. Marty, why don't you come on up? She signed my name. Oh, yeah, so neither one of you. They thought it was a sign. Okay. Oh, well, thank you. I, I misunderstood. You're doing a great job. Thanks. Yeah, like, <laughs> Would anyone else like to not comment? <laughs> Very good. But there are more who would like to comment. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I wanted to quickly come before you and let you know we have our State of the City breakfast coming up. You may have that in your announcements, but I did want to, to note that we have that next Wednesday. Um, it's a $20 cost to come. It's from 7.30 to 9 at the Cultural Center. Uh, Mayor Levy will be our speaker. We're at an all-time high with 80 people registered at this time, and we have until Monday for our cutoff. So um, as I was sharing with Mayor Levy this evening, I'm excited. We have several people coming up from Colorado Springs to share in this breakfast with us as well, and I think that's a bridge um, in keeping that collaboration between our communities going. So um, we're excited about that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we'll move on to reports. I'm going to start with the student art and apologize for two weeks ago when I, when we had, 
Spencer Richardson's art, and I referred to Spencer as a male. And I was told by more than one person that Spencer is a female. So I apologize, Spencer, and um, you have great art. I, just, <laughs> I, I, wish, I wish I would have known who you were. Tonight, uh, Trace Toronto, and I know Trace. Uh, he is definitely a baseball player. And he's, he's a he in sixth grade at the middle school, and it's a great piece of art. So thanks to Trace and everybody else that's participating in this program. And just so everyone knows, these are available if you'd like to, if you'd like to display them in your business. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you can contact City Hall and, and we'll make arrangements for you. There's a number of them at the administration building. So they're all wonderful. This would be a great time to have them in your business during, during the Christmas season. Okay, that's it. I've got a number of announcements, events coming up. First, I'd like to just mention driving to council today and, and hats off to staff as always, David and Bill and, and all the staff, but town looks exceptional. I, I always argue that it's looking as pretty this time of year as it ever does. And so once again, it's, it's beautiful. It's a great drive down Main Street and not just the city, but the merchants have really done a terrific job as always in bringing the Christmas season to Woodland Park. So um, most of these events uh, apply to the Christmas season. And we'll start with uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday, December 5th, the Kiwanis Breakfast with Santa at the Pass Cultural Center. That's a free event and starts at 8 in the morning from 8 to 11. Also on Saturday, December 5th, T-Crass sponsors, this is the first ever Jingle Paws, 5K Fun Run, and Dog Walk Fundraiser. At the Senior Center, it says 3.30. I'm guessing that's the time it's going to start, 3.30, for the 5K Fun Run. Contact uh, or call 686-7707 if you need further information. Also, Saturday, December 5th, one of our great events, the Christmas Parade. At 6 o'clock, followed by the tree lighting and Santa Claus at the Ute Pass Cultural Center. And back by popular demand, uh, we're going to have fireworks again this year. So it's great. If you were there the last couple of years, the parade and fireworks, uh, you don't see fireworks this time of year very often. So it's going to be very cool. Also, Saturday, December 5th and Sunday, December 6th, Tweed's Holiday Home Tour. Call 687-1115 for information bring a lot of people to town this weekend. We're supposed to have decent weather. Sunday, December 6th, the Women Park Wind Symphony presents the sights and sounds of Christmas concert. And that, too, will be at the U Pass Cultural Center at 7 o'clock. That, too, is a free event. Wednesday, this coming, uh, December 9th, the Greater Women Park Chamber of Commerce sponsors Mayor Levy and his State of the City Address. And there will be a question and answer period and breakfast. And call Deb or one of the volunteers at the chamber, 687-9885. I'll just comment on the state of the city address real quickly. It's a pretty good time to be the mayor and given the state of the city address. We'll have more on that next Wednesday. But I think uh, there will be a lot of people with a big smile on their face at that event. Saturday, December 12th, the Winter Farmer's Market at the U Pass Cultural Center. That's from 9 to 1. And next Sunday, a week from Sunday, December 13th, Women Park Community Singers present Christmas in Colorado Concert, also at the U Pass Cultural Center from 3 to 5, and once again, a free event. That's all I have. Carol? If um, <coughs> Council will indulge, I'll, I'll give you an update on where our Charter Review Committee is. We met last night with Aaron and Suzanne, and we've, uh, we're starting to get down to the, uh, putting, putting our actual uh, referred measures together. And I'm going to give you the highlights of those that we've already um, tentatively approved, because I think the more, more um, exposure the, the community gets to those uh, potential initiatives on the ballot in April 2016, the better. Uh, and these are chronological. We didn't necessarily review them in uh, a chronological manner, but um, uh, we're going to look at Article 2 of the Charter on Elections. Uh, 
specifically, uh, we're going to recommend an amendment that will change the nine successive year limitation to eight, affirm the four terms for mayor, and address something that we've called stacking, and that's when an, uh, an individual is appointed to fill a vacancy, um, and previously that uh, appointment period of time counts towards that eight-year max on, a, uh, on their office tenure, and we're going to recommend that the appointment no longer count against that eight-year max. Uh, that's one area. Uh, in Article 3, the vacancies uh, again will be addressed. Article 3 is this uh, article that addresses uh, uh, the duties of the mayor and the council. Um, we're going to recommend a, a slight change to the way we appoint uh, uh, replacements for vacancies in that we eliminate the 30-day requirement to accomplish that and also include the flexibility of potentially having a special election if, in fact, the council is unable to come to an agreement on the vacancy. Oh, under, excuse me, are you going to 60 days or are you going to a number? We're not, we're not going to eliminate no, days. no number to allow us a little bit more flexibility. It's obvious, obviously advisable to do it as soon as possible, but we're going to eliminate that uh, uh, actual date certain. Or at least that will be our recommendation. Um, under Article 4, under City Administration, um, we're going to recommend that uh, generally our city manager provides the annual report of the city in, uh, what are we doing, 60 days after the end of the fiscal year, which is basically the end of February, the 1st of March. Uh, we're going to allow the flexibility to actually do that after the um, audit is completed later in uh, the year. So those two, uh, uh, our ability to uh, accurately reflect the city's finances or the, the health of our finances uh, occurs after the audit. Uh, pretty simple, straightforward, but it has caused some confusion in the past. Um, under Article, or Section 4.5 of Article 4, uh, we're going to recommend the elimination or at least the ability of the council to determine if two positions in the city council or uh, on the city staff, the treasurer and the clerk, uh, are now required to be bonded. Uh, we also have insurance that cover both of those individuals. Uh, we're going to allow the council the option of using one or the other, and that is going to really provide a, soft, a, a cost savings more than anything. Again, that one shouldn't be too controversial. Article 7 under legislation, uh, we have a, 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 a really archaic requirement for the clerk to maintain three hard copies of our code. Uh, not only is it expensive, it's superfluous. So we're going to recommend that we only keep one copy of the code. Under Sections 7.6, 7.11, and 7.12, as well as 15.12, um, we're going to um, address the requirement to use all public notification uh, in the official city newspaper and allow the council the flexibility of using either the newspaper, the website, or other, some other conveyance, and that would be done by ordinance every year. It uh, doesn't mean we do away with um, a requirement to post in the newspaper, but we would have the option of also posting on the website. And for some reason, that takes up a lot of text in our charter. Under city finances, uh, we will address section, under Article 9, Section 917, uh, the prohibition against the use of municipal funds or resources or waiver of municipal funds or charges for services for private benefit. We have some slight uh, amendments that we will recommend to 9.17 that will allow the council the flexibility to consider um, using uh, municipal funds for uh, projects of valid uh, public purpose. Under Article 15, which is our miscellaneous uh, article, there were a couple, the requirement for Someone who comes forward and wants to uh, vacate uh, a public utility easement now requires, requires an ordinance, and we're going to recommend that that be done by resolution now. And I think we're also going to include uh, another section on elections, which really clean up uh, the entire article on our election process that we recognize uh, that when appropriate we simply comply with state statute and then there are some 
very specific uh, sections that this community has adopted over the years that we want to uh, retain, uh, but there's a lot of extraneous information or requirements uh, that have developed over the years that probably are not uh, appropriate anymore. So we're going to recommend get rid of them. And really, our, our primary objective in the, the committee review has been to simplify the charter, uh, to uh, allow it to be something that's flexible and will grow with the community uh, rather than uh, drag us down with, with, with concerns that might have been appropriate two decades ago but are, are no longer appropriate for this community. These will be individual questions in the April election? Yes, there will be individual questions. We'll probably have at a minimum seven um, recommended. Uh, and the reason I'm bringing this up tonight is we, we, we're going to have to uh, expedite the process. We thought we would bring this to council on a, an initial reading in the second uh, council meeting in January uh, when we reviewed the statutes and we're going to be required to actually bring that to the council in the first meeting in January. And the second meeting is going to be the public hearing. Any questions? Just a point on, on the committee that uh, these will be brought to council for council to be, uh, end up deciding which ones actually go to the ballot. Not necessarily will these automatically go there. And yet we're, we're, I think Aaron would agree we may have to bring each initiative as an individual ordinance as opposed to one ordinance. Um, will either council members or the public be able to bring up other issues that may not be covered by their six or seven that they think is maybe an issue that should be also go to the voters? Or are we only discussing the six or seven that come out of the your committee? I don't have an answer for that, Aaron. In a public meeting. I would, I would assume in a public hearing we could entertain other ordinances. Okay. But recall, we're... The first posting and the public hearing have to occur in January in order to meet the requirements for um, putting on the ballot in April. Right. So if someone decides that they want a new ordinance in January, so you got to do it that week. Quickly, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? It, it sounds like um, on the initial posting, the ones we talk about at that are the ones that will come to the, that's the only ones we can talk about in the second posting. Is that correct? No, no it's, you, it's just really, it sounds like it's open. It is, it's open, but again, you yes. understand that if you want it on the ballot in April, uh, any changes or recommendations to add to the recommendations that we'll bring to you, referred measures that we'll bring to you in January, We'll have to act on them very quickly. It sounds like what you've done is amazing already. It's I, mean, terrible. I would, I would fall asleep reading it. Right? So, but procedurally too, isn't when you send it out to the public? I mean, after we approve it, the second that's a second reading. Isn't there a public comment before it's on the ballot too? It, let, me, let me clarify. So, in order to amend the charter, um, it's done by ordinance. The charter currently requires that every ordinance be presented to council in a first reading at initial posting and then be published in full and then there is a second reading. So in order to have a charter amendment that will be on the um, ballot, that amendment has to be in front of council in the form of an ordinance on January 7th. So what can happen at the public hearing is the the wording of individual charter amendments could be considered, um, although the committee has spent quite a bit of time on the actual wording of those amendments. Um, but at, as you as council can always do at a public hearing, you can change the wording of an ordinance. Then it has to be again published and we've saved time in the schedule for that to happen. So if on the 21st at the public hearing, one or two of those um, ordinances, the, f the form of the amended, amended charter provision is tweaked, then we have the opportunity to then publish one or more of the ordinances that got tweaked 
in full again in time to meet the statutory requirements that all of that publication and um, uh, notices be published by um, the February 5th deadline. Yeah. So we're kind of in a catch-22 here because if we're going to do any tweaking, it's got to be in the first hearing, which is not normally where you do, do no, tweaking. Yeah. Uh, and, and also if there's public comment about wanting to do tweaking too, are we going to make an exception in this case that during the first hearing people will be able, able to express their views on this? I mean, there are a lot of people, for instance, on the election thing that were, were upset or you know, whatever. Well, I, I think the way that the process has in, been envisioned is that there's been a charter committee that's met in public meetings for a year, for a year, <laughs> uh, essentially once a month, and so you know the the opportunity has has been there. Having said that, um, you know, council um, would have to staff would have to present a form of ordinance that would have to be drafted and in place by the um, date for the agenda publication that precedes January 7th. So, uh, which would be December 31st. And Bob, wouldn't you argue if someone's chomping at the best to change something, it's been given a year, and if they come at the last minute... Uh, I don't think too many public showed up at those meetings. Well. Because they didn't want to. Or even knew about it. And, you know, I think we've done the due diligence with respect to transparency, and that I would not, uh, in my view, allow the process to be short-circuited, given all the work that's been put into it. Thanks. Well, that said, I want to just follow up on what Noel said. Um, leadership by Carol, uh, John Schaefer, Ken Matthews. I know I'm going to forget somebody. Peter Scanlon, certainly Aaron Smith and Suzanne. Who else? Who did uh, I forget? Val, 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 Val Carr. Val Carr. Uh, Eric, Eric Smith was on our committee until October, <coughs> and uh, Gretchen Bundy Ladowitz, who is a crackerjack attorney, I'll tell you what. Well, and the point is they've all done great work and, and spent a lot of a lot of time. Um, and to what Phil said, it's been going on a year, and, and we're not going to let someone short circuit this process. So. Thank you to everybody, and um, we look forward to the next meeting. Mr. Carlson, do you have anything this evening, sir? No. Mr. Matthews? No. Mr. Miller? No, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sawyer? No, no sir. Mr. Schaefer? I would like to uh, compliment Carol for her summary of what we've been working on for the last year. I feel that I've gotten two years of credit toward a law degree. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I can just find the time for the third year. Yeah. No, nothing else. Thanks, John. Yeah. Okay, we we'll move on to Aaron Smith. I have nothing else. Have nothing. Thank you. David? Just a reminder, Council, we will be meeting on December 17th. Thank you. Okay, will we have a work session uh, before? Yes, sir. Uh, but we'll get that announcement out. Okay. So please do calendar that now. All right, we do anticipate having that. Okay, I've got no comments on written correspondence, and this meeting is now adjourned. Spencer. 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 Spencer.